Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll begin in just a moment as we allow people to log on. Okay, our numbers have stabilized. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Witt. I'm the director of the Center for Global Studies, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon uh, to a, a book launch event uh, for Professor uh, Sonia Hernandez's exciting new book uh, for a just and better world, Engendering Anarchism in the Mexican Borderlands 1900 to 1938. Uh, this is our final event uh, for the Center for Global Studies uh, for our 2021-22 our Global Work Series this semester. Uh, we'll have more uh, coming up in January. Um, uh, but today we'll be uh, hearing uh, an interview uh, between uh, uh, Allison Searing, uh, the acquisitions editor of the U of I Press, uh, and uh, our author, uh, Sonia Hernandez, um, who will be talking about uh, the rise of mutual aid societies, uh, which is a concept central uh, to anarchism, uh, and uh, the constitute informal support networks that emerge globally. Uh, in response to the crisis produced uh, by the pandemic. Uh, uh, so this is uh, something that's uh, quite relevant uh, for today, though it's a historical focus. Uh, so it's, it's my pleasure uh, to collaborate uh, on this event uh, with the University of Illinois Press, uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, Allison Searing, uh, the acquisitions editor. Uh, she will introduce our speaker uh, and conduct the interview. Uh, before turning it over to Allison, uh, I would like to say a few words about the structure of the talk. Uh, to make this into a more helpful experience for all of us, uh, please submit your questions uh, to the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen uh, throughout the event. Uh, Allison will moderate uh, the questions uh, for Professor Hernandez uh, after the interview. Um, and in addition, this event will be recorded uh, and available on the CGS website later. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Allison, I'd like you to, to uh, take the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here today to introduce Sonia Hernandez and her book um, titled For a Just and Better World, Engendering Anarchism in the Mexican Borderlands. Um, I will also drop a link to that book in the chat as soon as I'm done speaking. Um, so this is her most current book um, that recovers the history of an anarcho-syndicalist network um, anchored in the Gulf of Mexico region. And it also links very strongly to our labor history um, interest at the University of Illinois Press. Um, Dr. Hernandez is an associate professor at Texas A&M University, uh, where she specializes in the US-Mexican borderlands, gender, labor, and modern Mexico. Um, as I mentioned, this is her second book. She's also the author of Working Women in the Borderlands, and also a recent book from the University of Texas Press, uh, Reverberations of Racial Violence. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk about her, her recent book, For a Just and Better World. And I think we're going to start by having her do a general overview of the book and talk about that a little bit, share a few images with you. And then we will do a brief Q&A between the two of us um, and open it up for questions from the audience. So uh, feel free again to use the Q&A feature um, if you have questions, and we will get to those towards the end. So Sonia, please share with us um, a little bit about the book. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you to the Center for Global Studies at the University of Illinois, especially to Maria Doropeva and Tim Polak. Thank you to the University of Illinois Press. Thank you, um, Allison Searing for doing this. And also thank you to uh, Heather um, Gernan. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Give me just a quick second. Can everyone see this? Uh, no, sorry. Oh, okay. it's not showing up. Give me a quick second. Can we see this? Yes. Yes, now it's working. Okay. So I am just really excited that um, the Center for Global Studies 
um, decided to do a series focused on global work because for a just and better world is precisely about issues of labor and issues of labor activism. And so uh, even though it is a book very much anchored in the Gulf of Mexico region with reach to the US-Mexican borderlands, it's very much couched in larger global, in a larger global context. And so, um, what, uh, whoops, give me a second here. Uh, just give me a quick second. I'm not sure why I'm seeing. Um, give me a second. <laughs> ah. Okay. Um, so when we talk about um, the emergence of anarchism in a more sort of abstract way and anarcho-syndicalism as a more structured uh, a system that placed ideas of anarchism within the larger context of labor unions and labor collectives in the Gulf of Mexico region, um, we have to say something about site and geography. Um, this is really important. Um, site matters here because the port of Tampico um, emerges as, um, as is a uh, place that welcomed people from different parts of the world. There were Russians, there were Chinese, there were Belgians, there were Greeks, there were Spaniards, um, Americans of various ethnic backgrounds, and certainly Mexicanos, particularly from the Mexican countryside that began to descend upon the port of Tampico uh, in the late 19th century, certainly by the first years of the 20th century, attracted to employment opportunities thanks to the discovery of oil. And so um, it already had this very rich uh, history with respect to the proliferation of mutual aid societies um, uh, that promoted ideas of mutual reciprocity that had built upon uh, pre-industrial, pre-Columbian ideas of community autonomy, of um, uh, worker autonomy, um, and uh, the sharing of political ideas, cultural ideas, and cultural lifestyles. So it's a place that in many ways was sort of ripe right, for um, the, um, uh, the, the introduction receiving of external ideas that spoke about issues of uh, worker autonomy, uh, worker dignity, and that term dignity or dignidad begins to um, uh, circulate quite widely in the area. So um, as, uh, oil production expanded a uh, working class, what we could call a working class enclave, um, emerges um, a couple of miles north of Tampico, and this was the town of Villa, Cecilia. Villa means town. In 1930, um, the town would be renamed uh, Ciudad Madero in honor of the revolutionary Francisco Madero. Um, and so it's uh, Villa Cecilia, that emerges as the home for thousands of oil workers, some with some kind of industrial work experience, others not so much, you know, from the countryside, mostly with agrarian, um, with an agrarian background. And so it becomes this, what, what I call in the book, like this um, home for, um, for radical ideas, a home for radical thinkers, if you will. Uh, not to mention, I'll talk about this as, um, as the event progresses, but, you know, this was also the site for numerous battles as part of the Mexican Revolution. You know, the Mexican Revolution of 1910 was one of a series of global revolutions of the 20th century, um, one of the bloodiest, I should say, um, you know, and, and uh, up there with, you know, the Russian Revolution, the Iranian Re uh, Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. And so, it's a, 
Uh, it's a place that, um, that uh, where, or that functions as sort of a, as, a, as, a, as a midpoint for the coming together of all these various uh, um, uh, folks from different backgrounds uh, and radical ideas um, uh, circulate quite widely because of the nature of the, uh, of the economy there. So it not only has a robust economy, but it's one that's tied to the export, it's an export um, economy tied to petroleum. Um, and so um, it, in many ways, it's sort of um, a, a safe haven at the beginning for these radical um, ideas. Now that would begin to change um, as the revolution would take, uh, would take uh, uh, place and would, as, uh, as various revolutionary faction, factions uh, uh, assumed power. And I can talk about that uh, a little later. Um, and so uh, let me just jump here to the next uh, slide. Um, uh, so sorry, I'm not sure why I wanna get rid of, um, I wanna do the slideshow and not uh, go slide by slide uh, and it's not letting me. Uh, apologies for, um, uh, for the text box here. Um, so um, with respect to an opening, a gradual opening for um, issues that particularly concern women, it's a combination of these ideas that are coming from abroad traveling with people themselves, with the migrants themselves, but also localized ideas that um, made it conducive for what we could call an, an early anarcho-feminist language and early anarcho-feminist discourse to flourish, not only promoted by women, but promoted by men as well. So on the one hand, you have um, external ideas um, uh, coming from abroad, particularly the ideas of Francisco Ferrer y Guardia from Barcelona uh, that had um, uh, promoted uh, the idea of something as really basic as um, an equal education for boys and girls at an early age. And this um, this idea of what we could we could call sort of an early expression of gender equity uh, makes its way to Mexico and places like you know growing urban centers like Mexico City, and it's the calm, the Casa del Obrero Mundial, or the House of the Global Worker, that takes the ideas of Ferrer and begins to um, put those ideas in practice through a series of, 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 of schools, uh, you know, small schools for the children of the workers and these workshops or talleres. What was the curriculum like? The curriculum consisted of some of the writings of Ferrer himself, of other thinkers from other parts of the world. And the workers, the Mexican workers took this material and put it in sort of, um, in language that, that kids could understand. And then they would then take the kids to the factory work sites. I mean, these were sort of like field trips, exposing those children to the life, you know, the typical, uh, you know, daily activities of a, an industrial worker. And, um, and so these, uh, these talleres and these workshops um, were organized by members of the COM, particularly one woman by the name of Reynalda Gonzalez Barra, that we can't really get to the main, to the main uh, historical figure in the book, which is Caritina Piña, uh, who emerges as a labor activist in the Gulf of Mexico region by the 1920s. We really can't talk about uh, the activism of Piña without talking about these women uh, that uh, that sort of uh, you know paved the road um, for women like Caritina Pina. So Reynaldo Gonzalez Parra, also from uh, the border, she was from the border state of Chihuahua, ends up in Mexico City and becomes involved uh, with the Casa del Obrero Mundial, the Com, 
And uh, by 1915, she moves to the port of Tampico and she helps to co-found, she is the co-founder of a com branch uh, in Tampico that emerges as one of the most um, dynamic, um, uh, you know, leading com branches in the entire Mexican Republic. And and so uh, it's the calm that um, begins to collaborate with earlier groups that had set up shop in the port, including branches of the Industrial Workers of the World or the IWW. Um, the other sort of emerging um, idea that also contributes to the, uh, the crafting of, a, of an anarcho-feminist agenda was the PLM, the Partido Liberal Mexicano, um, uh, and the folks who um, were members of the PLM were, were, uh, would eventually be known as Magonistas, and these were folks who were very much attracted um, to the ideas of the Oaxaqueño philosopher and thinker Ricardo Flores Magón. So it's Ricardo Flores Magón and the PLMistas that began to promote, um, among other issues, you know, including child, um, the end to child labor in the mines, uh, fair working conditions, higher wages. Um, they also began to promote um, gender equity within uh, the context of labor. And so this is this is really important because uh, this meshes sort of the, the localized ideas uh, promoted by uh, Magonismo uh, complement and mesh with external or imported ideas like the ideas of Ferrer, among others. I mean, even Magon himself um, was, a, was a, um, a voracious reader and he consumed the ideas of, of for example, the Russian thinker, uh, uh, Peter Kropotkin, uh, uh, Mikhail Bakunin as well. And so, um, of course, you know, there's Emma Goldman too. So there, there are these ideas that um, oftentimes it's difficult to sort of pinpoint if they're um, sort of homegrown localized ideas reacting to the local um, context and local conditions. Uh, or if these were sort of just taken kind of, you know, from abroad and, and uh, applied then to the local context. So it's a mixture of both. And that's what um, I argue in the book. Um, all this to say that that makes it conducive for, a, for an opening, a political opening for women um, to claim a space, not only as obreras themselves, as workers themselves, but as women who would be central to the coming of the real revolution, not this revolution that the anarcho-syndicalists at this point uh, that were members of the COM and the PLM and others, you know, they began to critique the revolution as saying it's been co-opted by these bourgeois leaders, you know, leaders like Francisco Madero and Venustiano Carranza, known today in history books as you know, real revolutionary heroes. Well, for these anarcho syndicalists, they've they've co-opted labor and they're bringing in labor um, as you know a partner of the revolutionary government. And anarchists are not interested in that. And so it's really important to point out that uh, women like Reynalda Gonzalez Parra and later Caritina Piña, they really emerge as some of the more more radical voices. Um, in this sort of larger burgeoning women's movement. Because there are other women fighting for other things, primarily suffrage, but these women are not interested in promoting universal suffrage. And they argue, well, why are we gonna do that if we're only gonna become pawns of the state, right? We're, we're gonna have to collaborate with a political party and that's not, that's not our vision for, quote, a just and better world, to quote Caritina Piña. Um, and so um, it, so in the book, I spent uh, the, the first couple of chapters, um, I talk about uh, Reynalda Gonzalez Farra and other women too, Isaura Galvan, um, who made her way sort of in a reverse migration pattern, uh, leaves San Antonio, Texas to um, Tampico and joins uh, the labor movement there. And so it's these women who sort of, you know, set 
um, set up shop and and you know made it uh, or contributed to that sort of early opening uh, for then women like Caritina Piña to emerge um, as um, you know uh, to continue uh, being active in in the greater labor movement. So Caritina Piña, I mean, this is very much a um, a story of you know revolutionary Mexico. Caritina Piña comes from a, quote, revolutionary family. Her father had been a general in the Porfirian army. Um, and in many ways, uh, you know, uh, it was precisely because of the conditions uh, that were, um, um, that were, or the, the socioeconomic and political conditions created by the Porfirian government with the help of US capital that had um, ushered in uh, a call for revolution. Um, and Caritina Piña's uh, father ends up uh, declaring support for Venustiano Carranza for uh, after the assassination of Francisco Madero. And sorry, I'm like giving like you know, five hours of Mexican history here compressed in like 30 seconds. Um, and so he decides to support um, Carranza and uh, her half-brother, Senaido Piña, had already been involved with Magonistas in Southern Tamaulipas. He had, uh, he was described as an alzado, an alzado is like a rebel, a revoltoso, um, and had been involved with various groups in Southern Tamaulipas. And so uh, point here is that revolution was not this foreign idea uh, for Piña, right? This is something that was probably discussed in the household. And so she, um, you know, she was probably exposed to these ideas. It's kind of hard to pinpoint because the archival record is not very precise when it comes to this, but then sort of, you know, as we piece the, the puzzles together, um, you know, she was surrounded, uh, we, we could argue she was surrounded by revolutionaries, right? And so she uh, becomes then involved after the, the family moved to Tampico as there were, as were others uh, moving to Tampico for employment opportunities. Um, and it was in Tampico where she met the anarcho-syndicalist Esteban Mendez Guerra. Mendez Guerra was a former Pancho Villa soldier. He had fought during the Mexican Revolution. He had been a minor. He had been exposed to um, the uh, Magonista ideas uh, about worker, uh, worker conditions, uh, and particularly horrible in the mine. So he had, you know, he had that background already. And so after um, he fought in the Battle of El Lebano in the outskirts of Tampico in 1915, he decided to retire in Tampico and he met Caritina Piña, um, probably uh, 19, 1919, 1920. And so Mendez Guerra uh, organizes an anarcho-syndicalist group dedicated to freeing political prisoners. It was called the Comité uh, Internacional Pro Presos Sociales. And Caritina Piña becomes a head of correspondence. She becomes uh, basically the person in charge of handling all kinds of propaganda. So she is very well aware of not only the labor situation in the Tampico via Cecilia area and throughout the Mexican Republic and across in places like Texas, but she's also, um, she's also very well aware of labor issues happening across the Atlantic. So she gets news from Buenos Aires, from Barcelona, from Liverpool, certainly from Havana, among other places. So this positions her very, very firmly in not just a regional labor movement, but I argue in the book that she's really at the, at the forefront of what essentially be uh, this, uh, what essentially could be called a global movement. Um, and of course, you know, she's not only collaborating with anarcho-syndicalists, uh, she's collaborating also with communist groups, with um, socialist groups to a lesser extent. And there's really much more collaboration in Tampico between communist collectives and um, uh, anarchist collectives. Um, and so, um, you know, in her capacity as head of correspondence, she is 
Um, she begins to send petitions on behalf of the Comité to release prisoners. She's involved in the Sacco and Vanzetti case, a very well-known Sacco and Vanzetti case in Massachusetts. She petitions um, uh, um, the judge handling the case for the imprisoned Gastonia mill workers in 1929 in Gastonia, North Carolina. She's also uh, petitioning on behalf of political prisoners in Mexico, like Librado Rivera, who was a close associate of Emma Gold, uh, sorry, of, of uh, Ricardo Flores Magón. Um, she's also very well aware of the commentaries and the um, and the uh, and the, and the um, thought pieces written by women like Emma Goldman, which are reprinted in the Tampico Anarchist Press. And so she's a, a fascinating figure, and I can talk more about um, her in the in the Q and A uh, part. Um, and uh, without ever leaving her native uh, Tamaulipas. So just to kind of close here, I want to just uh, point to a couple of you know, major takeaways or, or um, conclusions, if you will, uh, from uh, the examining the women that open or that pay the road for Caritina Piña for eventually uh, for um, when studying uh, the case of Caritina Piña. Um, we oftentimes think of anarchist ideas as very sort of uh, abstract or like anarchists are, you know, in their own world. Uh, um, they're so sort of far removed or it's a French movement. Anarchism and particularly anarcho-syndicalism, which, which took the ideas of, uh, of uh, anarchist thinkers and put them in uh, a structure where the labor union and the labor collective was at the center. Um, those ideas translated uh, to, to real on the ground openings, to real on the ground uh, changes, and particularly so for women, because it was uh, it was a, a philosophy, it was an ideology, uh, regardless of sort of which strand you're looking at, that that at least in rhetoric, placed women on par with men, and that was uh, that was revolutionary, because then that women could claim. Uh, and could hold their colleagues accountable. Like, look, this is what we are preaching, uh, but this is not, right? We're not seeing this in, in our own collective. So it, it, it was a real tool to use. Um, I think we need to be careful when we examine uh, anarchist collectives. We oftentimes sort of, uh, it's, it's very easy to glorify them. And that was something that I struggled with early on writing this book where you're just enamored, you become enamored with these subjects. And they're, you know, um, very idealistic, utopian, and they're progressive. But um, as uh, as is clear in this book, uh, anarchist collectives were also very much gendered. Um, there are numerous examples in the book. Um, I'll just share one where um, the main uh, anarchist uh, organization, the Confederación General de Trabajadores, the CGT which served as the umbrella organization for all these smaller affiliates, um, compares the Krom and the Krom uh, collaborated with the revolutionary government. Um, they, it, it compares the Krom to uh, a, a prostitute, um, not promoting the real uh, ideas that labor, that organized labor needed. And there are other numerous examples. They call um, those who were collaborating with uh, with the socialist governor, um, who had, you know, certainly by the late twenties, early thirties, co-opted organized labor. Um, they uh, call those folks uh, comadres chismosas, like gossipy women. Um, they also uh, talk about those men who are who don't want to participate in the real revolution as not real men, lacking masculinity. And then, of course, for uh, for uh, for women, women are promoted as compañeras en la lucha, comrades or or um, you know, supporters in the fight, in the struggle. And so there's a gendered uh, there's a gendered uh, component there. But women at the same time take these sort of what we could describe as sort of normative gender uh, ideas and terms like motherhood or, or uh, the practice and the concept of motherhood and they revolutionize it. And they began to claim a space in these anarcho-syndicalist collectives 
um, saying, look, we, uh, we have a central role to play because we will produce, right? We are the reproducers of community, but we're going to produce real fighters, you know, not these sort of, you know, fake ones. And so they use a concept of revolutionary motherhood, very similar to what the state, the revolutionary state was using, but um, anarcho-syndicalist Caritina Piña and Reynaldo González Parra argued that this motherhood was a motherhood that served the interests of the community, of the families, and not the interests of the state. Um, I think uh, it, there's plenty of evidence that suggests uh, and that, that points to women's direct involvement in this larger critique of industrial capitalism, not just in Mexico, but the US as well. And uh, certainly in, uh, if we look at the various, um, uh, the various uh, uh, moments uh, where Piña participated in freeing political prisoners, uh, including those uh, in the United States or who, or who had been deported. Um, there's, a, there's also in the book, I, this is more getting into sort of like the theoretical framework of the book, uh, where I, I find the idea of feminismo transfronterizo or this transnational feminism or you know, feminism with a little F and with an S at the end, you know, borrowing from the ideas of the thinker, um, the late philosopher Gloria Anzaldúa, in looking at um, anarcho-feminism as sort of one type of uh, feminism that was that was sort of both you know grounded in local context, but also very much sort of attuned to what was happening across uh, certainly across the U.S.-Mexican border and across other kinds of borders, um, and and it's again precisely the the um, the fact that anarchism um, promoted a nation-less world that, you know, for women like Aritina Piña, they were not certain, uh, necessarily promoting a nationless world. They were acting as if there were no uh, national boundaries. And so it's a very interesting, um, a very interesting concept for me because it, it, it it, uh, it made more sense to me uh, in sort of better understanding what, um, what the goals of these women were and, and this larger network. Um, and, uh, very quickly here, I think I'll just uh, reiterate um, this uh, idea of like the real revolution is yet to come, you know, this Mexican revolution uh, that basically just plays um, uh, leaders like Venustiano Carranza and certainly at the local level, someone like Emilio Portesil, um, who were, you know, catering to organized labor, but they were sort of setting the, setting the, the limits of what kind of labor activism could be, uh, could be um, practiced. And so it should not surprise us that these great revolutionary heroes began to crack down on communists and uh, anarchists. And they began to then uh, promote the rise of what was basically a state sanctioned socialism um, that really takes hold uh, in Tamaulipas as a political ideology by the 1930s, which coincides with Piña sort of fading into history. I don't know how else to put it because Piña I struggled a lot with this uh, while doing research because by when Piña's father dies in 1931, Piña leaves uh, Tampico and heads back to her hometown of Ocampo in the countryside of Tamaulipas. And uh, it, uh, the only thing I could sort of um, uh, conclude is that the death of her father was uh, just really just really hard on her that she left the labor scene because she doesn't reemerge not even in Reynosa. She ends up dying in Reynosa in 1981 uh, of a diabetic coma. And uh, given Reynosa's uh, more recent history, you know, we look at the 1970s, 80s, uh, it, it, it reemerges as a major uh, oil producing site for Bemex, the state controlled oil industry of Petróleos Mexicanos. But she's nowhere to be found. She's not active with the labor union there. Um, and so, uh, it's uh, it's interesting to see as as Piña departs from Tampico, uh, anarcho syndicalism uh, as a, as a sort of a structured and, and a uh, a major sort of 
political ideology uh, or movement uh, begins to decline because there's really no use for for anarcho syndicalists anymore because um, the there there are all kinds of labor laws that had that by 1931 had already been codified. So there's a minimum wage. There's a right to form unions. There's a right to strike. Right. And so it's the revolutionary government that takes advantage of that and basically co-ops labor uh, to this day, um, and certainly by 1931. Well, um, I will stop there because I had promised that this was going to be, let me stop sharing my screen. I had promised that uh, this uh, would be a short uh, introduction. Sorry, there's there's so much to there's so much to say, um, but I'll stop right there and answer any questions that Allison may have for me. Great, thank you so much, Sonia. Even though I've been involved with the book for a, a, quite a while, um, it's always great to hear it again because there are really so many actors coming together and so many groups, and um, so it's really important to be reminded of all those complications that are coming together in this story. Um, so I know you talked a little bit about kind of the economic situation going on in Tempico that might have led to some of uh, some of this activity with the anarcho syndicalists, but could you talk a little bit about um, why the Gulf of Mexico region emerges as a hot spot of radical activity and what the role of the US Mexico border is in this activity? Yeah, no, thank you. And I'll just follow up from some of the comments that I had shared early on. Uh, you know, Tampico uh, becomes the home of three major oil corporations um, operating with US capital, with British capital, uh, El Aguila, Piers, and Huasteca. Um, Huasteca, if you, some of you may remember from like the US history survey classes, the Teapot Dome scandal, Edward Doheny um, uh, controlled Huasteca. Uh, 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 petroleum in Tampico. And so, so it's, it's a place that um, uh, counted with, gosh, over 15,000 oil workers, um, not, not all uh, involved with the anarcho-syndicalist movement, but involved with other labor collectives uh, and eventually labor unions. And so there's a lot of cross collaboration here in uh, in sort of major holidays like May Day, for example, where all these different organizations, regardless of ideological affiliation, would come together. And so it's it's a place that you know this is this is the 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 in many ways the birthplace of the Mexican oil worker, right? That would be crucial for um, the expansion and the success of labor unions. Right, to the point where by the 1970s, like almost everyone, everyone in Mexico belongs to a union, right? It's a, it's a highly organized um, uh, country. Um, there are problems with that too, right? You know, because there was certainly, we can certainly talk about political corruption in the unions tied to political parties, tied to the, the PRI, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, um, and uh, other, other things. But um, so it's a place that, that welcomes early on that welcomes uh, uh, laborers and that promotes uh, the organization of workers into labor collectives and labor unions, building on this earlier tradition of mutualismo, right? That is uh, that is you know pre-industrial and to a certain extent uh, you know built upon the indigenous cultures of the Huasteca region. Um, so there's um, there's sort of that other angle as well that I think is important to point out. Um, the role of the US-Mexican border is crucial. I mean, Tampico in many ways is sort of like what I, I write about this in the book as the intellectual uh, hub of the greater Mexican Northeastern region, which includes the US-Mexican border. And the proximity to places like Texas just make it really conducive for these folks to launch attacks right, to plot revolutions, right, from um, the U.S. side, of course, with, with, with uh, you know, the, that, that was risky business as well, right? Ricardo Flores Magón and Liberado Rivera um, were in prison because of, you know, violate the, because of, uh, they were violating the U.S. Neutrality Acts, and Caritina Piña helped to uh, send petitions to free, uh, to free them, by the way. Um, and so uh, we, we also need to point out that 
By 1917, there were over 100 PLM or Magonista branches in the state of Texas. So there is a, a robust intellectual uh, exchange of ideas um, that uh, brought the, the region closer, um, closer together. And so it just, it, it, then it, it emerges as a, as a really important uh, um, site for uh, the promotion of radical ideas. And, you know, there is scholarship on this but there's very little on the role of women. And at least four of those Magonista branches were all female branches and the other PLM branches open its doors to women. So that is just amazing. That to me tells me that we need to revisit the, the labor, labor historiography, particularly Mexican labor historiography and borderlands historiography, which ties to other labor historiographies across the world, right? Because these folks are very aware. They're, they're not, you know, they're not provincial. And, and for the longest time, Mexican historiography sort of cast the border state of Tamaulipas as this like backward, narrow, provincial region. But if you examine it from a labor historical perspective, it's all but, right? And they're very attuned to what's, what's happening uh, outside of their, of their own communities. fit into the larger theme of global work and activism? Yeah, um, I think, uh, I think, let me, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, start with what I just ended with, um, in terms of historiography, uh, casting the border state of Tamaulipas as this provincial narrow place. Um, and so if we look at um, the, uh, the conditions that made it conducive for this region to emerge as a labor hotspot, it, there, there's so much to say about the ideas of, you know, uh, 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 Russian revolutionary thinkers, uh, uh, Greeks, for example, uh, Plotino Rhoda Canati, who ends up in Mexico and is active in, in Mexico City. Um, uh, and then uh, workers from Tampico began to, um, to adopt those ideas and recirculate those. Not to mention there's an IWW branch. There's an industrial workers of the world branch um, that set up shop, I believe in 1907 or so tied to the Maritime Workers Union there in Tampico. So this is the place um, where, um, you know, extra local ideas are shaping the, the particular labor situation um, in, in the region. Um, and um, I think it's also, um, important to note the role of the anarchist press. So even though we're talking about a small anarchist press um, uh, in, in the Tampico Cecilia region with newspapers like Germinal, Tribuna Roja and others, um, uh, there was a just remarkable job done by other anarchist thinkers in Mexico City, in New York, um, um, in Buenos Aires that then took those um, uh, news stories uh, from, uh, you know, from uh, their own, uh, their own uh, locales and then reprint it and send, I mean, Caritina Piña handled the correspondence. So she's getting all this material and all these news stories are being reprinted. And so these, um, for, for, for these labor collectors in Tampico that are not that are not huge, that is like, you know, important advertising. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. Um, that was paid often in uh, with donations, right? Small donations. Caritina Piña herself shows up as one of the donors at multiple occasions for Regeneración for for the PLM's main um, uh, literary outlet. Um, and so there, there's this new, constant news sharing that I think is so critical. I mean, that's one of that's how Caritina Piña finds out about the Saco and Vanzetti case, right? I mean, you know, from from her from her home in Via Cecilia, she finds out about what's happening uh, to these two uh, anarchists, right? Um, and so then she decides to write a petition and 
she knows, you know, she knows the um, uh, that network very well. And so, yes, this is very much anchored in Tampico and the greater Gulf of Mexico region, but boy, it has all kinds of connections to other places across the US-Mexican borderlands and across the Atlantic. Thank you. I, I like how you bring up anarchist print culture, because I always find that to be a fascinating aspect of a lot of anarchist groups in a lot of places. It comes down to their print culture. Um, so yeah. another question I had is Caratina Pina is connected to the global labor movement, yet she never leaves her native Tamaulipas. And that always is a fascinating point of this to me. Can you talk a little bit about how she became so influential internationally while still at home in Mexico? Yeah, and you know, so so as far as per the historical record, she never left um, Tamaulipas, although she she came pretty close. I mean, she ends up dying, as I mentioned, in Reynosa, Tamaulipas, which is right across uh, the border uh, from McAllen, Texas. Um, that was in 1981. So um, so she is pretty much um, you know. Uh, sat in uh, Via Cecilia and in Tampico. And, uh, but yet, in, if you look at um, the, the primary source material that I was able to recover that features her voice um, in the petitions um, that she sends, uh, you know, she sends, I mean, I'll just give you an example of sort of how she is very much sort of um, uh, has this sort of transnational mindset and outlook. So she writes uh, uh, to Judge Barnhill in North Carolina. And so she's, you know, really, really concerned that uh, there are uh, female mill workers uh, that had been detained alongside other uh, workers and, and with children uh, who were working in, in, uh, in the textile, um, I mean, sorry, in the, in the mill uh, in North Carolina. And uh, she so she's, she's, she writes that she is aware of the situation and she's pleading, right? She's pleading with the judge, you need to release them because this is, right, this is for the, for the good of the great human family. She doesn't say the great Mexican family, right? It's this larger, you know, concept of family again. Um, she's very much using that gendered language to make sense of labor issues. Um, but she's also very much aware of her local conditions and, and the bias shows. So she critiques those uh, capitalists, um, factory owners, and she compares them to Indians without civilization. And here she's, you know, the, the reference point are, you know, the Aztecs, right? The, the great Aztec civilization of Mexico. Uh, but these other Indians, right, that, you know, we don't, you know, we don't care about these other Indians. Um, so she actually makes that comparison. And so it's reflective of, of how she makes sense of, of extra local matters, uh, kind of using her own kind of, you know, community surroundings. Um, and this is what I call sort of, you know, the process of transnationalism, that it's, it's a process that's made during that moment of exchange, regardless of whether or not someone actually stepped out or was like a migrant. Um, early on in, in the, the early drafts of the manuscript, I, I used a concept, um, perhaps not very well, that I, uh, that I called an a ideological migrant. Right, an ideological migrant, and uh, but to, I wanted to sort of like you know pinpoint that the fact that she was so attuned and involved with other with extra local matters and uh, and never having stepped uh, outside of Tamaulipas, um, I ended up uh, sticking to labor cultural broker, a labor intermediary, um, because um, just all these other labor organizations just had such a tremendous impact on her and that's visible in the correspondence. Um, um, I will say that um, uh, when I first discovered Caritina Piña, it, it didn't, there was a mismatch with what I had read uh, in terms of Mexican labor historiography and what I had read particularly about the Bico, right? This like robust oil worker culture, uh, activism. And uh, she, you know, there was plenty of evidence uh, about her role. And 
she was like she had never been credited for um, for her role and for her activism. And so, um, but that you know, if we look at it from the perspective of a women in this case, there's a whole new narrative that emerges. That's why I'm so excited about this book. It's great to recover the women and their story and their influence in this. Um, you and you've mentioned a few times, you know, the the historical record and the limits of the archive. So I'm curious, what are some of the most significant primary or secondary sources that you use to create this narrative? Oh, for sure, um, the Archivo de Librado Rivera, the Archive of Librado Rivera. Librado Rivera was uh, from San Luis Potosí, from also from the north, and a close collaborator of Ricardo Flores Magón, of Lázaro Gutiérrez um, de, de Lara, which appears on the, the, the cover of the book with the Magonista women, the revolutionary women. Um, and so I point that, I point to that uh, digitized archive. Well, it's, it's always been a digital archive. It, it's not housed in, in any repository. Um, and that's in, in great part thanks to the wonderful work of historian Monica Alcayaga Sasso, um, who wrote this uh, wonderful dissertation uh, on Librado Rivera and his um, um, and his participation with the Red Brothers, the Hermanos Rojos, uh, founded in 1917 in the port, with you know all kinds of links to the IWW, to the to the Com, and to the PLM. Um, and so I point to that because. That archive has these small and rare, but very influential newspapers. So Germinal, Tribuna Roja, um, La Vida Libre, uh, Ruta. And there, there are a lot of newspapers that we just don't have access to. And this is just, it was amazing to me because there are, um, there are other, I mean, I talk about other women, right? Caritina Piña sort of takes center stage in the book. Um, but there are other women as well, and I was able to to recover those stories precisely because they they show up as writing a poem or a commentary or um, you know some kind of you know small editorial note, and they're there. And so it's it was just uh, I don't think I would have been able to to write this book without that archive. The other archive um, is the uh, which is in fact in a repository. Uh, at the State University uh, in the, of Tamaulipas in the, in the capital of Ciudad Victoria. And that's the Archivo de Esteban Mendez. And I showed the image of Esteban Mendez. So his archive is there. And that was um, absolutely crucial for, um, the, uh, for, for me to recreate this, uh, this story. Um, Esteban Mendez Guerra, um, I mentioned the Comité Progresos uh, Internacionales, uh, which Piña was a uh, uh, head of correspondence, but he also organized other collectives. And their, their meeting minutes, there's correspondence, there are newspaper clippings. A lot of the newspapers um, that are housed it, at uh, the um, um, in Amsterdam, the, the Institute for um, Social History, uh, apologies if I'm not getting the, uh, the name correctly. Um, I got some wonderful uh, photographic images from that, uh, from that archive for this book. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, uh, some are not complete, right? But there are a couple of newspaper clippings here and there um, that are um, housed in uh, the Amsterdam uh, uh, archive. And um, just um, prove that not just Pina, but other women played a, a pretty remarkable role in uh, not only in labor matters uh, in, in terms of Mexican history, but uh, were very much aware of what was happening in other parts of the world. Um, and it's, it's interesting, Allison, because one of the pioneer historians, uh, Mexican historians of that region wrote basically an index for that archive, but he never mentioned Caritina Pin. This was published in the 1980s, and I'll just leave it at that. I won't say his name. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty detailed index of the archive, but Caritina Pina, Pina's name is nowhere to be found. But then you go to the archive, and there are documents she produced with her signature. 
So this is going to sound funny, but uh, when I first started talking about Caritina Piña, I would I would include like her signature in my PowerPoint presentations. Like th th it's proof. This is proof, right? I'm not making this up. Like this woman existed. And uh, then you, as you find other material, right, it's always really important to cross-reference material. And so as I was going through um, uh, copies of Regeneración, the PLM uh, newsletter, I saw her name as a donor in several issues um, where, you know, she had made a contribution. And I was like, further proof that she exists, further proof, right? And it's amazing to me that, you know, that even the 1930 Mexican census listed Caritina Piña as, quote, dedicada a quehaceres domésticos, that she was dedicated to, um, to, to a domestic uh, household chores. There's no mention of her uh, working, you know, she contributed her labor to the comité. Uh, that helped to release uh, prisoners like Liberado Rivera and, and others. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, it was just remarkable to me how she has really been just pushed to the margins in, in Mexican labor historiography. exciting that you found her and I can imagine how you know wanting to prove her existence that I really enjoyed the story of you including her signature that's really that's really nice um you've talked a little bit about how um anarcho syndicalism kind of after you know the 1930s and Pina Pina's father passes away and she leaves San Pico um that it really kind of fades into the background so what are the continuing legacies of this movement Movement and labor activism more generally in this region? Yeah, I mean, so even though, uh, you know, not just with respect to the anarcho syndicalists, but just organized labor in general, even though it becomes co opted by the Mexican um, state, um, there's still these, um, uh, you know, um, uh, developments or you know practices that have a lot to do with the spirit of anarchism, which is direct action, always holding, even if if, if there's there there is sort of I guess what I what one could call resistance within a context of accommodation, right? So there's always like uh, this you know uh, critical um, or, or examining the state and, and state agents and state activity with a very critical eye, holding them responsible. They're the battles. I, they're, they're, they still take place in places like Tampico and across the Mexican Republic. Um, the, the work stoppages, um, uh, the, um, the blocking of major roadways, uh, the blocking to you know, the entrance of like airports, uh, for example. Uh, and the spirit also of just grassroots um, uh, collective action. And we're definitely seeing that in Mexico today, given the continuing um, drug turf war, which has hit the Maulipas really, really bad. Um, and it's affected historians too, that you know it's hard to, to travel and continue doing research in places like that. Um, but there are people coming together and they're, you know, sharing information about, you know, uh, through social media and through other networks uh, about, you know, avoiding uh, this place over here or that place over there because of the presence of, of uh, drug cartels or the uh, continuing encounters between the military uh, and uh, the various drug cartels. Um, and so they're, they're, there are these, um, you know, continuing legacies, right? So even though anarcho-syndicalism has, especially, you know, through the main organization, the CGT, the Confederación General de Trabajadores, um, really sort of then becomes uh, in, in some way ir irrelevant because those labor laws had been codified already, that spirit of collective action and grassroots action uh, lives on. Um, and also that, the idea of a gender equity that was uh, real, that was not, you know, um, you know, that that was all inclusive and complete. Um, that also, I would argue, that uh, is inspired by, you know, anarchist thought dating back to 
um, to the 19th century and certainly at the turn of the 20th century. Thank you so much. Um, so that's kind of the end of my questions. Um, so I wanted to invite anyone if you know the audience or other um, others have questions that they would like to ask. Um, I definitely welcome that. Oh, so, so Tim, um, Tim asks, you spoke about anarcho-syndicalists cooperating with other workers' revolutionary movements. Can you talk a little bit more about the competition and conflicts among different revolutionaries in Tampico, both in terms of ideology and organization and the control of workers' movements? And how was female participation distributed among these competing movements? I know, thanks Tim for that question. So there's certainly collaboration and, and uh, particularly around like major moments, like uh, anytime there was a major oil strike from any, any of the three major corporations, there were groups, you know, Hermanos Rojos, which is an anarcho-syndicalist group, the Comité, um, uh, Piñas group uh, and others were, were collaborating with, for example, the Dock Workers Union. The Dock Workers Union was more of a socialist uh, socialist organization that um, then began uh, or would emerge as, as an organization with very close ties to the governor, to Emilio Portes Gil um, by the 1920s. And so there's collaboration there, but there's also tension in what one can see it um, through the periodicals, through their news outlets, where and it shouldn't surprise us because they're competing for, for, for members. And, you know, this is part of uh, the, the second part of your question, right? Like, you know, how is membership distributed? Well, they're competing for, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for bodies, right, for members. And so, um, and in some cases, like for the COM, for example, the Tampico COM, which was the leading anarcho-syndicalist uh, organization in Tampico, there, there are folks with like double or triple membership, right? Like there are folks who also have a, a membership um, or who are affiliated to the IWW or the PLM uh, or Hermanos Rojos, right? And others are, there's a Herminal also that I, I talk about in the book. Um, so we can see it in the periodicals where they are, they, they claim like, so this is the real solution to our labor issues, guys. You come to us, right? This is, this is where you, you, you want to see a real revolution uh, take place then join our, our fight, you know, don't join the Krom, you know, the Krom is collaborating with the state. Um, and so, um, you know, there were communist uh, uh, folks or, or folks who were sympathetic to communist ideas involved in the Krom. And so we can see it there, but when it came to sort of like a major, a major uh, development that concerned all workers, um, there was participation and collaboration from different different parts. So, you know, they're not all just like, you know, um, narrow minded uh, and, and sticking to their, uh, to their particular philosophies, to their particular ideologies. And the other question was with respect to, let me see if I can read it here, uh, women. Um, so um, as far as uh, the historical record is concerned, I would say that membership, it, that female membership in anarcho-syndicalist organizations is pretty pretty consistent with uh, female membership in communist organizations, particularly the communist, the Tampico communist branch of the uh, FUPDM. I know that's a long acronym, the Frente Único Pro Derechos uh, um, de las Mujeres. Uh, there's a famous uh, communist uh, labor activist from Tampico uh, who was a medical doctor, is one of the first medical doctors. Uh, in the area, Esther Chapa Tijerina. I talk about her in the book, and I talk about sort of the, you know the the similarities and also some differences. I mean, there's a, certainly similarities with respect to um, like reproductive rights um, that both uh, women sympathetic to communist ideas and women and uh, sympathetic to anarcho anarchism and anarcho syndicalist uh, ideas. Um, you know, their interests align pretty pretty well. Uh, labor issues, of course. Um, using the language of mother of radical motherhood of course but when it came to like because communist organizations uh were affiliated to certain political parties anarcho-syndicalists were not at least not in the Tampico region and so that was a main uh, main difference and so 
Um, I would say they're pretty, they're pretty uh, consistent. It's hard to, to, I can't give you like raw numbers. It's hard to sort of come up with those raw figures. Um, but I'll say the, uh, the um, socialist type of collectives attracted the greatest number of women. And this, th these were uh, organizations that uh, were sanctioned by the revolutionary government of Emilio Portesquil using women really uh, uh, in, in, in two ways to increase the standing of the Partido Socialista Fronterizo. So it's a socialist uh, border party with lots of women participation and uh, using women uh, through the party to promote anti-alcohol campaigns. And this is part of like, we talk about the progressive period in the US, this is also happening just across the border. There's a morals campaign, there are like, you know, and, and uh, it, trying to integrate women into, uh, into the PSF as a way to say, uh, hey, women uh, belong uh, in politics, but in a limited way. For socialists, they, Emilio Portesil was not supporting women's suffrage, for example. And so that is a continuing critique on the part of these anarcho-feminist women, like, why do you wanna cooperate with the Portesil government? They, they don't believe in the real emancipation of women. So it's a continuing sort of uh, competing discourse that we see. That's, that's a great question. Thank you. I'll just mention quickly that I put a link to the book in the chat. Um, so if anybody wants to get to it directly, it's there. Um, yes, thank you for showing it um, and all your lovely sticky notes. That's fantastic. Um, and we are also having a sale right now. So you can get the book for 50% off along with a lot of other great books. So if you're interested now is really a great time to buy, I would say our books, but also scholarly books in general. This is a good, good time for a sale. Um, so curious if anybody else has questions. I have I have one more that I'm always curious to ask writers about. But how did you first come to write this book? What was kind of like the germinating idea? Yeah, no, thanks for that um, question. And I usually start um, uh, anytime I talk about um, my projects. I usually start with like, why I got interested in this. Um, and so I'm not an anarchist. I always get the question. So is that why you got into this? Um, I, I don't think I'm good enough to be an anarchist. Um, uh, I believe in a lot of the ideas that uh, anarchists promoted, but it's, it's, uh, um, I, I say that I'm not good enough because, uh, gosh, you really have to be really, you know, committed, but it, it, it's hard. It's, it, again, it's, you know, uh, I'm trying to um, reject a lot of the things that a lot of us enjoy, right? You know, and, and uh, which, which has a lot to do with, um, with capitalism, right? Um, but, you know, that's not the reason why I ended up writing this book. I wrote, a, I wrote this book because, um, because of that archive I discovered while I was um, uh, writing my first book. And so um, my first book is based on my dissertation, which looked at women's labor in urban centers and the countryside in Tamaulipas, Nuevo León, and Southern Texas, um, 1880 to about 1940. And while I was doing additional work for the manuscript, I discovered the archive of Esteban Mendes Guerra in uh, Ciudad Victoria. Although I think it should be in Tampico because it's mostly you know, Tampico history, but it is um, uh, housed in Ciudad Victoria. And, um, and uh, as I was going through uh, the documents, I came across Caritina Piña and, and uh, but at that point, you know, I wanted to finish the first book and it was, uh, and that book, uh, you know, I engage anar anarchism, anarcho-syndicalism, but it's mostly uh, looking at uh, women's labor contributions to the making of the U.S.-Mexican borderlands and the inner, intersection of, of, um, of gender, labor, and class um, and region. And so um, as historians often do, uh, you know, you, you find a document and then you just put, you know, FFP, right, for future project. And, um, and it sat in my, in, in a file folder for several years. Um, and 
then you know now it's uh it's it's the the story the the crux of the story uh, for a just and better world thank you that's so wonderful i always love hearing those stories so does anyone else have questions I know it's kind of getting to the end of the semester for everyone, but I definitely thank you all for joining us. And it was just lovely to hear from Sonia and hear even more about um, this really important book. And I think it really, your talk underscores why it's so important to bring these women um, to the forefront who have been there all along, um, but, but who we haven't been familiar with. Um, so thank you so much. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free also to reach out to me. And again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you to the University of Illinois Press. Thank you to um, the University of Illinois, the Center for um, Global Studies for organizing this talk and for all of your hard work doing so. I hope you find For a Just and Better World enjoyable. <laughs>